Uh, Joe Boggs is an assistant professor with the OSU Extension and the OSU Department of uh, Entomology. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here well, with the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Now I'm going to mic up, but I will tell you that uh, I'm probably one of the few people that I know that have been asked when I've not had a mic on to turn the mic down. So uh, I have a voice that tends to carry, so we'll see how this works. Um, I do appreciate this opportunity. My wife and I actually live in Liberty Township, and so we don't live very far. And I've always admired Centerville for a bit from afar, but not that far. I didn't realize this community was founded in 1796, though. That, uh, I'm kind of a history buff, and I just did not know the age of Centerville. So that was a, a pleasant thing to learn. We're going to talk about Agent Longhorn Beetle, the threat in black and white, because this potentially could be the most catastrophic non-native we've ever had introduced to our shores. And I'm not overstating it. You'll see why in just a bit. My first point then today is Asian Longhorn Beetle, an ALB educational programming, and we do have some challenges here, but I want to kind of sketch out who we are, who Extension is. Very important, we are education. We're about education. Ohio State University is a land-grant institute, as is Purdue, as is Michigan State, as is University of Kentucky, and all those land grants have an Extension arm based in counties, based throughout the state. So that's what we're about. We are about education. Our mission, for example, engaging people to strengthen their lives and communities through, and this is very important, research-based educational programming. Now, we're not regulatory. However, when it comes to something like Asian longhorn beetle, there is a regulatory aspect, certainly, to it. USDA APHIS, I love this uh, acronym, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. It just looks like aphid, doesn't it? It just really sounds like what it is. And the Ohio Department of Agriculture. We have a very strong partnership for messaging. But they are regulatory. They have legal authority. You go to the Ohio Revised Code and you will find ODA clearly, clearly you know, a regulatory arm. If you go to the Federal Registry, you will find USDA APHIS, clearly a regulatory arm. But we're not. And this is important because sometimes there is, we do have challenges with messaging. Now you've probably seen these signs. Now I have to admit, my wife long suffering over 30 years of marriage, you know, and I hide her glasses thing, you know, that's nice about getting older, right? We can't see as well, you know. <laughs> She's actually the one that pointed this out as we were driving along and I about wrecked when she said, will they call? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> you think about what does it really say? Drug impaired drivers call. <laughs> Sorry. So my second point, this is a Saturday, so I had to put some levity in here to keep everybody awake. I'm going to talk about insects. So my second point is we are in EAB and ALB land. Emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. Emerald ash borer, frankly, all these counties should be in green because we suspect that we have populations there, they just haven't been discovered. Now, Asian longhorn beetle, as many of you know, was found in Ohio in a location centered on the town of Bethel in Claremont County. So we have both beetles. We have both these beetles. They are the 800-pound gorillas of the boars. Uh, those are the gorillas. We don't know what the heck that is. Point being is, it's not just Ohio where these cross over. If you look at the Emerald Ash Borer current map, now each little dot on there is where it was originally detected. This does not depict population density. Uh, there were maps where it was every report, and of course this area of Ohio was really red, that area was really red, but what they went back to was just where has it been found. Now I'm going to add some dots. These are not the size of the Asian longhorn beetle infestations. I'm just showing locations. Toronto, of course, Bethel. We have New York, uh, a couple of boroughs in New York City, Long Island, and Massachusetts, Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, there are a couple dots here to see that are fading out. That's because those infestations have been eradicated. But I want you to notice how many Asian longhorn both uh, infestations, both current and in the past, are within very, very short distance or overlap with emerald ash borer, all the red dots. So what's happening is we have this problem that I call um, beetle blending. Now they do have some things in common. 
They are Asian, they're non-native, they're invasive, and they're tree killers. So these beetles are similar in some fashion. But there's a bit of a challenge here. Beetle blending means this, and you'll have this happen. ALB or EAB, when people say Asian longhorn beetle, it's very common for that person to hear emerald ash borer. And when you say emerald ash borer, sometimes, depending on where a person's located or what's in the media, people think Asian longhorn beetle. And of course, everyone in this room knows, if you say University of Michigan, what do we think? That's in my contract. I'm with Ohio State, now come on. The reality is, these two beetles are like apples to oranges. They are very, very different. They're very different. And why this is important, look at this. Differences in biology, behavior, spread, distribution, and management. That just about covers it, doesn't it? They are literally like apples and oranges in almost all respects. So let's talk a bit about emerald ash borer because that is ripping through our area, right? It already has ripped through our area. We've already lost a lot of ash trees to emerald ash borer. It's native to, to northeast China, Siberia, the Koreas, and Japan. It was first identified in a Detroit suburb in 2002. However, it had been there for about 20 years prior to discovery. That's important to note. So this non-native that is now all over the place was causing canopy thinning, and we just, no one was, was uh, oh, like this giant bee. So all these things that can produce uh, thinning canopies, you know, this is what we were probably blaming. You know, verticillium wilt is actually a killer, and it causes a thinning canopy. Construction damage, so you have compaction of the soil can do the same. Prior to 2002, we didn't consider something else. Emerald ash borer was not on our radar. We didn't realize it was lurking in the trees prior to 2002 and thinking this. Now, anyone speak Chinese? I do not, I don't write it, but I did go online because I just want to say, you know, they are going to be speaking in a different language and that means take over, I think. Or if somebody speaks Chinese and writes Chinese, maybe I have something that's really bad up there. I don't know. Always take a risk. As a result of that, all this area now, you can see all the little red dots where emerald ash borer has been moved. It didn't fly there. It was prior to discovery. It was moved around. We can't fault anyone, really, although we could probably say we should have done a better job of diagnostics, which is where everyone in this room and we all come into play. But eradication is not realistic now. Here I am, for example, evaluating trees in Wisconsin. The folks up there gave me this hard hat, and uh, that's what they said they always wear. And I, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, really nice people. They have great senses of humor, always laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> but the important point with emerald ash borer is insecticides can protect ash trees. Asian longhorn beetles, also native to Asia, China, and the Koreas. How did it get here? What we do know is that we've had record, we had records for years of interdiction. So like for example, you can go online and, and, type, and find Asian longhorn beetle reported to Cincinnati and Northern, uh, uh, Cincinnati Northern, Greater Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. I think I have that backwards. But nonetheless, that's considered a port of entry. And uh, Homeland Security, I used to be given another name, would be looking for things coming in, and you'll see reports of occasionally a beetle or larvae or pupae of Asian longhorn beetle. They didn't get loose, they didn't go to trees, but being shipped in. The same with other ports. So we know that these containers, which are measured by TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units. Now you see these go down the road on a 40-foot trailer, that's two TEUs. So a TEU is 20 by 8 and a half by 8 feet. There's a big container ship being loaded. Just use your imagination, right? Just use your imagination. When I first started in 2011 teaching about Asian longhorn beetle, that's because that's when it was discovered in Claremont County, the largest container ship, as I recall, was something like 13,000 TEUs. The CSCL Globe is one of five she has five sister ships, and she's the largest capacity container ship in the world currently at 19,000 CEUs. Now, I do want to emphasize something here, and that is you may have this feeling, oh, they're just going to keep coming, they're just going to keep coming, but I do want to say that in 2006, there was a very serious worldwide meeting 
of shipping countries, which basically included all the major countries in the world, to agree upon terms. Prior to 2006, for example, the owner of these containers could claim that they're going to fumigate on the high seas and they could leave port, they could claim they're going to, how can you fumigate way down inside here? Because those regulations were made back like with me and maybe with you, 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 you picture, you could picture transport of goods and it's the old cargo net, right? You've all seen that. Prior to these containers, well you could do that 50 years ago, but you couldn't do this now with a new container. So the stiffening of the regulations means after 2006, they're going to have to ride on top of the containers and maybe we can see them, right? That means I'm so happy. <laughs> and we see these containers go down the road, put on trains, and then they arrive and they might have wood packing material, and those wood packing materials may say made in China where we have these non-natives. But we must be a little careful not to get xenophobic. There is no way we can turn back the clock on worldwide shipping, is there? Nor, I think, do we have that desire because it's been so beneficial for the economies of so many countries, including our own. But because it's gone two directions, in Asia, in China, this native that we call fall webworm, that we really don't pay a lot of attention to, yes, it does cause early Halloween decorations, but it kills nothing. In China, it kills fruit trees. We call it the fall webworm, they call it the American white moth. <laughs> And we kind of laugh at that. I laughed at that when I first, American white moth, and, until I realized, well, what do you suppose they call Japanese beetles in Japan? <laughs> My point being is, it has gone two directions. So all countries, Europe, all continents are suffering by this infusion of non-natives. So that's why in 2006 the regulations were stiffened successfully. So ALB in North America, there are some consistencies here. Usually a single point, I shouldn't even say usually, so far it's always been this way, a single point of introduction directly from Asia and then multiple related infestations in a region spread by movement of infested material. So unlike Emerald Ash Borer, when we know it got started in the Detroit area and then got moved around, Asian longhorn beetle, all the infestations thus far have been originated directly from China, not from somewhere else in the U.S. That's very important. That's a very important point. So for example, it was first found in Brooklyn, New York in 1996. That's the first time we recognized that it had made it to our shores, Brooklyn, back when a tree grew there. I always look around because I hate to tell you that's an age-related reference now. It's so disappointing. You will notice people below about 30 looking at each other. Brooklyn? What is he referring to? All of these, all of these infestations originated directly from China. However, they started here and then things got moved around. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? That's where it started, then things got moved around. These are all interrelated, but look what has happened. We have been successful, well, USDA APHIS and others have been successful at eradication and they're still working on it. Chicago, all of these infestations resulted from a single point of introduction and then it got moved around. But the good news is that eradication has been successful throughout Chicago, so it is no longer officially considered to have an infestation. Now when I say eradication, what does that mean to you? At zero. Outstanding. You know, this is a great group. Usually, I have to tell people, because I love audience participation. I'll do that. I'll turn and ask a question. I want you to participate, but sometimes, because uh, a little bit, you know, people, you know, will just mumble. And that's okay. I will accept mumbling. <laughs> but put emphasis on it. But this group is great. There was no mumbling. Very, very good. Exactly. It means zero. It means there's no detection. In the case of, of Asian longhorn beetle, no beetles, no evidence of boring the trees, nothing. It is gone. Wiped off the face of the earth in that location. When I say eradication, though, it also means that even though that was declared many years ago, they are still closely monitoring that area and it will probably be monitored for a number of more years just to be sure because too much is at stake. Toronto, this really does show that 
point source of introduction and see all these other circles out in here, that's where it got moved. Now it's kind of unfortunate that it was declared eradicated in 2013. Unfortunately, there was a new, you know, so April, everybody's celebrating, and in 2013 in September, about 15 miles away in Mississauga, was found a related infestation that had been undetected. So you can't really see a little washed out here, but there's the uh, regulated area in Mississauga, just uh, southwest of Toronto. The good news then is, these are not the size of the infestations, by the way. I had to make it big enough for you to be, and I even had to kind of make a little shading here so you could see the infestations. What are you seeing there? The good news is relatively small, distinct infestations. And this means that eradication can and has been successful, and then we can do the happy dance, right? <laughs> Makes us all happy. I didn't know this was going to be on tape, you know, but uh, uh, what's done's done. How did it get to Ohio? We do not know how it got to Ohio officially. We really don't know for sure. Now, working for Ohio State, we have some theories. <laughs> Don't open a box for Michigan is all I can say. <laughs> Actually, what we do know is here's the whole state. There's the point. That dot isn't the size of the infestation. In June 17th, uh, on June 17th, 2011, well, my career changed because I became then very involved in doing what I'm doing today because of this discovery. Now, here's the dot pretty close to the size of the regulated area. I just blew it up. In September, I want you to notice what just happened there. So there's the first find, and then we have this little dot going over to Monroe Township. What happened? It had been moved, unbeknownst to anyone, prior to the discovery. And then in 2012, look what happened. The Beatles got in a car and drove up the road. What happened, and this is a very sharp gentleman that lives up here in Stone Lake Township. No one knew, so it was prior to 2011, no one knew we had ALB. He had friends in the Bethel area. They had a maple tree that was all but dead, and he said, I'll take it down and for free if you let me use this firewood. Oh, that's great, so he did. Took it up here, and then he started noticing something I'm gonna emphasize here in just a second. Branches were breaking off some of his maple trees that shouldn't have been breaking off. And then he reported the infestation. That was very, very sharp. That's what we want. What does this say? Remember, a single point of introduction directly from Asia, then multiple related infestations. Now here's why every opportunity I get to speak in our region, I try to take that opportunity because that was 2012. So far, no other infestations have been detected. But are there other infestations? I have to tell you, every year it goes undetected makes me feel better, but I can't say unequivocally that there aren't. That's point number one. Point number two is, if there are other infestations, there's a possibility they were moved before discovery. But then I need to kind of make a, kind of stress a point here. A couple of months ago, I gave this same talk over in Louisville. And they were really worried. The reason they wanted me to speak was they were concerned about it coming from here. I said to them, it's probably more likely if it is here that it came from someplace else right from Asia. Instead of looking east, you may want to look behind you. You may want to look around because I have no more reason to believe. In fact, I have less of a reason. I think this is heading towards eradication eventually. So I think we're going to be safe from that infestation. However, we all need to be aware of what may have already arrived. And that's why speaking to you is so important. So 61 square miles under regulation. We know that it came directly from Asia. Now be kind of careful how far you take this by DNA analysis. Now this doesn't make these different species of beetles. It's due to the founder effect, or some biologists will call it Adam and Eve effect. You started with very few beetles maybe only a male and female, so it stands to reason that they are closely related. The variance, in fact, is about the same as a paternity test. But it shows that all those beetles were closely related and didn't come from New York City, or didn't come from Chicago, or didn't come from Toronto. Does everybody follow that? It's very important. That's a nice thing to know. Well, First in Ohio, hello Buckeyes. The southernmost ALB infestation thus far found in North America. 
Found in a rural area dominated by forest, the infestation doesn't appear to be associated with any transportation hub. And you can see this on a Google Earth map. There's Bethel, what do you see? You're not looking at Cincinnati, are you? You're not looking at Chicago. You're not even looking at Worcester, Massachusetts, which is actually a pretty major transportation hub with railroads in particular. You're looking at a rural community. Came as a complete surprise and found in an area that produces firewood. Yes, I don't have a fireplace, but I always get firewood when I get gas. <laughs> Actually, I want to be kind of careful here. I'm not implying this still goes on because there is such a thing called a compliance agreement. And it's a very important thing. If I'm a firewood producer within the regulated area, I can work with ODA, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, and the USDA APHIS, take training and agree to periodical inspections of my property, and I can have, I can continue with my business through a compliance. And as a matter of fact, it, in my opinion, it is wonderfully good because I can say with great certainty, this firewood did come from Claremont County. I have no fears of it being infested because that work is that good. However, you always need to be aware if you just know someone who knows someone, oh, I know a guy, I, I know a person. Be careful about that. The take home message is don't assume ALB is somewhere else. It can pop up anywhere, but early detection is essential for eradication both in terms of time and money. Our infestation, I didn't really uh, show you a map of Worcester, Massachusetts. So far, that infestation is the largest one found in North America. And they are really having to take a long time, a very costly length of time to eradicate it. So if you let the beetle go too far, it's just common sense. It's going to take more money and a longer period of time. Ours is actually fairly small. They don't like to be eradicated. So, identification. This is a huge beetle, as already indicated. It is a longhorn beetle, so named because of the length of the antennae. Now, these are the, this is the female. The female has shorter antennae than the male, but this is a big, bombing beetle. I mean, look at the males, they're big. Look at my colleague trying to coax one down from a tree. And the females are huge. Look at that, boy, I tell you, that was. Actually, okay, so there's a female, shorter antennae, there's a quarter. My hands are pretty good size. There's a male with longer antennae, and look at the size of that beetle in my hand. It is the biggest beetle you will ever see. We have a few that come kind of close, but we do not have any that look like this beetle. Now, I, am, I have a PowerPoint I've put together to standardize teaching on Agent Longhorn Beetle, and a little section in there is on so-called look-alikes, but I'll tell you, when you look at these other beetles that people confuse, they don't look anything like it. On the other hand, I do want to stress this. If you see an unusually unusual big beetle and you think, well, wait a second, you know, I, this could be Asian longhorn beetle, we'd much prefer that you report it than to say, well, maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't, isn't very good, right? We'd much prefer that you report things that turn out to be negative than not report things that are positive. That's very important. The larvae of longhorn beetles are called round-headed borers because of this big thoracic, first thoracic segment. The head's actually right there. Now you need to be careful with longhorn beetle larvae. In fact, all insects, it's very difficult to identify them based on the immature stages. They look like this looks, all of them, all round-headed boars, all cerambicids, all our larvae look like Michelin men. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you will find native longhorn beetles today out in dead and dying trees. This maple, for example, look when we get up close, look at these big round holes. Those are being produced on this dying maple by a native longhorn beetle that we could have pulled out the larvae that would look just like this. Now, a little story on this. This is actually in eastern uh, Hamilton County, very good arborist involved in managing the trees on this property. He's, he's been certified to detect Asian longhorn beetle. But still, he called and I went and looked at this tree. Do you see what I'm saying? That is how we want things to do. Don't overlook the possibility. Don't say, well, it's dying, so I just want to plant the seed, though, that it could be one of our native. On host trees, you will see, and it's just unfortunate, in my opinion. Sometimes you go online and, you know, the most disappointing thing that, out of this whole thing is me discovering that you can't believe everything on the web. I, I just, I it totally burst my bubble. <laughs> 
But some very high-end um, sources, uh, you know, actually, and I will act, I love the U.S. Forest Service, but this is actually how they, they depicted the hosts in one of their online publications. Preferred host, rare host trees. What's that imply? Top of the line food, only when starving food. That's not at all accurate. I want to say that it's not accurate. If I were to be really unkind, I may even say it's a little bit like this. <laughs> I won't be unkind. This is how we would much prefer that you consider these hosts. Very good hosts and other hosts. Very good hosts. Here's the list. Maples at the top, horse chestnuts, Ascalus, Alma, Salix on down. Now, there is a slight drop. These are slightly preferred over these. Now, I was trying to figure out how to teach this a few years ago, and I like meat, maybe everybody here doesn't, but I do, and I know that porterhouse steaks are a little bit better than T-bone, aren't they? Just a little bit. But if, if I don't have a porterhouse, I will be thrilled with a T-bone. <laughs> and quite frankly, if I don't have steak, I will eat hamburger. And that's exactly what the other hosts are. Does everybody follow this analogy? It is very essential, very essential. Because as a matter of fact, the number one host in China, guess where it lives, is poplar. Non-native poplars is the number one host in China. Asian longhorn beetle is actually a problem on the poplar plantations in its own native country. So if we, called, if we put poplar under rare hosts, begs the question, why is it the number one host in China? Well, that's why I'm saying. It's just other host. Why I'm making such a big deal out of it is this is 13 genera. I tried counting up the number of species of trees, and I always kind of lose track, you know, somewhere around 90 to 100, because I've taken my shoes off to be able to keep track, you know, counting. And my point is, we're talking about tremendous numbers. Now, I will say this. Let me go back. Hackberry has been removed. It's been discovered that perhaps hackberry, based on what's been observed here and elsewhere, is probably not even another a, a, a other host. But it still leaves 12 genera, and we call these genera high-risk trees. Why do we call them high-risk trees? Because those are the trees that um, form lights. That can produce adults. Every tree on this list, include the, uh, including the other hosts, females can lay eggs on, larvae can develop, and new adults can emerge. That's high risk in an eradication program because what's the definition of eradication? Zero. So this means any one of these trees could be a host. That's why they're called high risk. So impact, it's gonna be, it would be bad enough if Asian longhorn beetle went the route of emerald ash borer. It would be appalling. But if these two beetles were allowed to go the same direction, we can't do anything about emerald ash borer, and we're losing ashes. But if we added Asian longhorn beetle, it would be catastrophic. Take a look at this uh, work that actually is still pretty valid. Dr. Mike Raup at University of Maryland in 2006 and others did a survey of some different communities, some big and some small, to assess the diversity of street trees in eastern North America urban centers. And if Asian longhorn beetle or emerald ash borer were allowed to go the same route. The trees in red are the Asian longhorn beetle trees that are lost. The trees in green, of course, would be emerald ash borer trees. Look at the devastation in urban centers. It would be catastrophic. I mean, this is exactly how we would all feel about it. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> how does it kill trees? How does it kill trees? Well, short segue. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, if you don't put humor in an entomology talk, even I go to sleep. <laughs> so we're going to talk a bit about, the segue is going to be talking a bit about tree stem anatomy and function in the basics here, and that is, if we start at the outside and work our way in, so we're looking down on a stump, a, a cut tree, we have this ring of bark on the outside. Beneath it, we have a very thin, in fact, in reality, it's much thinner than I'm even depicting. In, in fact, most times, if, if we go out today and say we're gonna pull bark off a tree, you know, well, you, know, well, um, you would be pulling the bark and the phloem. What's left, that little slimy area, 
that's left behind on top of the xylem is the cambium. But my point is, most people believe the phloem is part of the, the bark. It's not. It's a very thin ring, though. It's just beneath the bark. And then we have this magical ring of cambium. I'll get to why that's magical in a minute. Followed by the rest of the tree, the thing that holds the tree up and transports nutrients and water, the xylem, the wood of the tree. I said cambium is magical because these cells can divide, the fancy name is meristematic, meaning that they can become other things as they get older. These cells can become xylem to the inside, in fact they do, or they can become phloem to the outside. They're like teenagers, they don't know what they're gonna be till they grow up. But that directional change is how trees get larger in girth, think about that. The cambium's contributing to the inside and to the outside, making trees larger in girth. But they don't only do that. If we expose cambial cells to oxygen, they produce some incredible material called wound or callous tissue. So like, for example, if a tree gets hit by lightning, we've all seen this, so there's the lightning strike. You get closer, that roll of tissue that we've all seen is the tree's attempt to close that wound. It's why we call it wound tissue or wound closure tissue. It is different than xylem and it's different than phloem. It's the way trees heal. This is what you really want to see around a pruning cut. Why is that being formed around the pruning cut? Because the cambial cells have been exposed to oxygen, but the person that made the pruning cut did not cut so that they removed cambial cells. That's a very nice cut. This is even better, look at that. That's what happens eventually, the wound closes up. This is why we no longer recommend pruning sealer. Because what does pruning sealer do? Keeps oxygen from exposing. And you know, it's, it's not, we all, and I even do it all the time, it's called anthropomorphism. It's where you, you, know, you give a non-human traits to non-humans, or you give human traits to non-humans, rather. And so, the idea of pruning sealer was originally designed like a Band-Aid. But we heal differently, don't we? And Band-Aids can help us heal, not a tree. Not a tree, because they heal differently. Well, it's a different lecture. Sorry, I got carried away. Wound tissue also equals bark cracking. So here's Asian longhorn beetle with bark cracking. That's because the effects of the beetle, the larvae, have exposed cambial tissue to oxygen. You get that lip-like wound tissue, causes bark cracking. You're probably seeing this with ash. I actually pulled the bark off this tree so you could see that beneath the fissure, the crack in the bark, why is the crack being formed? Because that lip-like tissue is swelling and it's cracking the bark. So that's how that, that symptom develops. Food flows through phloem. Sugars from the leaves come down, stored carbohydrates go up. It's multi-directional. How do we know that sugars flow up the phloem? Outstanding, great, you guys are really good. Yeah, maple syrup, my favorite dinner. You actually tap the phloem, you're not tapping the xylem. If you've ever been involved in maple tapping, you, might, you run the tapper in to be held in the xylem, but it's the phloem that you're getting your, because you know, all this in the, in the xylem is just water and nutrients. You couldn't make syrup out of that. But the sugary material from the phloem is what you're after. So this is tree trunk basics. But it gets a little more complicated, I'm sorry to say. I actually intended to lock the doors by this point because this is where you start, oh my gosh. This is. We have ring porous and diffuse porous trees. Ring porous trees, only the outermost ring, the most recently produced ring of xylem is functional. That's ring porous. Diffuse porous trees, you have four to five rings that are functional. Four to five rings. Now, this is not black and white. This is one of my favorite sayings. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those that divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. <laughs> so we do have semi-ring porous and semi-diffuse porous trees. So I implied that it's, a, it's a, a black and white situation. It's cut and dry, it's one or the other. But if you notice though, we don't have trees on here predominantly that are, except for the poplars here that are, e, that are Asian longhorn beetle trees. We don't have maples and we don't have ash. So now let's talk about some tree killing behavior based on what you've just learned. And let's talk about how insecticides may or may not come to play. So back again to emerald ash borer, emerald ash borer. 
What kind of tree is ash? It is ring porous. That means there's only one functional ring. So along comes the beetle. She's the one that selects the tree. It's the larvae that feeds on the phloem of the tree that eventually kills the tree, but we'll get to that. Because she comes along, she lays eggs, I want you to notice this very clearly, on the bark surface, on the surface, right there. Those eggs hatch, and now look where the larvae are feeding at all end stars. Now you're saying, wait a second, Joe, they're feeding on the phloem clearly, but now they're feeding on the xylem. Actually, they're not. Remember I said that phloem ring is very thin. They start etching the xylem because they get larger in girth as they get older. They can't help it. This is actually the very first tree found to be infested in Warren County. And when I took these shots, I intended only to show the serpentine uh, gallery of emerald ash borer, but I, I, I actually caught something else. Way over here, there's no etching because the larvae were too small to etch the xylem. As they got older, they couldn't help but etch that first ring of xylem. They just couldn't help it. Now, that makes them a phloem feeder. That's very important. We have different bores. This is a phloem feeder. Little pet peeve, sometimes even my fellow entomologists will call things like this a cambium feeder. What's wrong with that? Cambial tissue is only three cell layers thick. They'd be little tiny bitty beetles because they'd have very little to eat. They're feeding on the sugar-rich phloem. Very important, sugar-rich phloem. It's also why woodpecker damage for emerald ash borer is very, very shallow. You may be seeing this. You can see this here locally. Well, eventually, <clears throat> you have all the plumbing stripped out of the tree because it's a ring porous tree. That one ring of xylem is destroyed and the tree now has no plumbing. And then we get this thing sometimes we call synchronized death, meaning that as the populations rise, you get a lot of trees dying at once, synchronized death. And that's kind of how we feel about it, right? We've seen this. We've seen this. This street in, Tor in, uh, in Toledo, these trees look pretty healthy the year before this shot was taken. Look at it one year later, that's synchronized death. And we all know, I mean, I'm not telling you something we haven't already learned locally, unfortunately, and that is it puts a lot of burden on our urban forestry programs. Now you're, I know this, that, that there is a treatment program being done here in Centerville by the Centerville um, not maintenance department. Uh, yeah, and they're, big, they're, they're continuing to be pretty successful, aren't they? my understanding. Well, part of the reason that's important is because if you lose, you go back to that, imagine, imagine, you know, all, handling that by a city. To, uh, Toledo really had its hands full because that's when we first started seeing this. And there's something else. What happens when ash trees die? Let me back up. Why do we make baseball bats out of ash? There's a question. Not just resilient, very hard. very hard, and what else? Flexible. Not flexible, unfortunately. Very light. It has the highest strength to weight ratio of just about any of our hardwoods, strength to weight. So that bat is very hard, very strong, and it's very light. Except, you said it, whenever you watch it, I was at a Reds game when, you know, when they were using their bats a, a few years ago. <laughs> Sorry, and, uh, and, and I don't know, I can't, but at any rate, I just happened to be at a place where I could see this bat break, and it does, they don't just break, what do they do? Yeah. They, they shatter, they blow up, because unfortunately it's very strong wood, but it's very brittle when it's dead. That's why those bats fly apart. You ever see a maple, you can watch major league bats, sometimes they're made out of maple, what happens when they break? They just kind of break. They don't blow up. So now look at these trees and think of a baseball bat. What's that telling you about liability? All I can say is I hope that car is traveling fast. <laughs> <laughs> but again, insecticides can protect ash trees. This goes back to this phloem feeding aspect, very important. Because as it turns out, the phloem is a pretty effective zone for our systemic insecticides. Now systemic insecticides we can apply them somewhere around the roots, inject into the tree or whatever. They go into the, the system of the tree 
and then they protect the tree from other things. Could be from boards, it could be from leaf feeders. We can pour it around the base of the tree, depending on the product. We can inject into the soil. We can inject directly into the trees. If you want to write this down, although most of you were, were really too far gone on emerald ash borer mostly to, to, to initiate this in our local area, but this particular publication, emeraldashbor.info, this is the second edition of Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees from Emerald Ash Borer. Ohio State, Michigan State, Purdue, Colorado State Extension all partnered to produce this, and this is the second edition. So you can learn what will be uh, uh, eff uh, effective meaning that if you do make the application, you get little to no damage, and then you have a nice ash. Insecticides can protect ash trees, treated, untreated, but there's an important point here. What's the goal? Eradication. No. Emerald ash borer, what is the goal? We can't eradicate emerald ash borer. We can't. And it's not even to save the tree. I hate to burst your bubble on that one. It is to maintain a full canopy. The goal is to maintain a full canopy. Now, believe it or not, that does not translate into zero infestation. This could have 10% infestation. And who cares? Because the canopies are full. You don't even know it. We learned this from Japanese beetle grubs. You know, it was really a surprise where you'd have really nice turf grass, you'd pull it back, and oh my gosh, there are grubs under there. But who cares? Now, if you had dead grass, you pull it back, you care. But what would cause you to pull back the turf to begin with is, unless you're an entomologist, you're going to pull back healthy turf. See where I'm heading? So it's the same with that. It is not, and this is a very important point, it is not to kill every emerald ash borer because this is not an eradication program. And that's important. <clears throat> Insecticides can protect ash trees, but you can't wait till they start looking like this. If they get to this point, you've lost all translocation of material. If you try to treat these trees to save it, all that's left will be ash holes. <laughs> if I had a way to stop the tape, I don't know. <laughs> All right, back to Asian longhorn beetle. Now, Asian longhorn beetle goes after a very different type of tree. Its primary host, its porterhouse stake is maple, which is diffuse porous. So the, uh, the female selects a tree, she lays the eggs, the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the tree, but I want you to notice something right off the bat. Where is she laying those eggs? This isn't a mistake on my graphics. She's laying the eggs right on the surface of the xylem. This female, I timed her 18 minutes chewing through the bark, through the phloem, down to the xylem to turn around after 18 minutes of chewing to lay one egg. And with ash borer, it's indiscriminate. She's just laying, oh, there's a good place, another egg. This beetle takes its time. It's one reason populations don't build as fast as with emerald ash borer, because they take their time. There is a first instar larva sitting right on the xylem. There's the phloem around it. Now, why that's important is those larvae could feed a little bit on the phloem, but they will definitely go into the xylem. Sometimes they'll go, this thing will not feed at all. They'll just bore right into the xylem. Sometimes they feed a little bit on the phloem, but most times... And they will eventually entirely feed in the xylem. This is a xylem feeder. What kind of feeder is an emerald ash borer larva? Phloem feeder. And that's what it looks like in real life. Now, this looks bad. I mean, eventually even this little bit of damage will cause the phloem to be destroyed. But look at what's left with all the xylem feeding. Even with that kind of damage inside the tree, I want you to notice something. This is in Worcester, Massachusetts. This tree is very, very close. In fact, you walk across the road and it's where they believe the infestation got started. So this tree was exposed to a lot of beetles. The canopy is only a little bit thinning, but it was generally agreed that actually probably canopy was thinning because if you, you, know, you can't see behind the truck, but it was in a terrible location. I mean, the tree wasn't pl and it planted in the best of location, but the canopy is starting. Look, look at these holes, folks. 
on that other, what's the take home here? The first take home message as we've been teaching everybody, you and everybody else, what do you look for there on my dashboard? Thinning canopy. Asian longhorn beetle, it no longer counts. Thinning canopy doesn't count. But the second take home message is look at all this damage. This, this is the wood of that tree. Remember the gentleman in the Stonelick Township? How did he detect a Asian longhorn beetle? Broken branches? Look at the structural weakening. Here's the take home. Healthy maple branches. Healthy, the tree has leaves on it. And the branches start breaking. And you look at the ends of the broken branches. I'm teaching arborists to do this. Okay, there might be a little bit of a windstorm. There may be a little ice and a little snow load, whatever. But if you, uh, what you really need to do is when you have a branch that breaks, instead of just saying, well, it was the wind that caused it, look at the end of that broken branch. If it's a living maple and it looks like this, we're in trouble because we only have one beetle that we know of that does that. And why that's so important is that in every, including over in Bethel, in every Asian longhorn beetle infestation thus far, that knowledge has helped people to detect new infestations. The Mississauga up in Toronto, broken branches. It's been a very good indicator. So, detection, very, very important, detection. Heavily infested trees, you're gonna look for holes on live trees, pretty big holes, and holes you can stick a pencil in. We call this the pencil test. Now, why can you stick a pencil into it? Because look how deep, it's a xylem feeder. You have to use a special pencil that says Asian longhorn beetle on it, right? <laughs> why do you suppose these woodpecker holes are so deep into that tree? It is a xylem feeder, so deep woodpecker holes. The pits, pits created, we call them oviposition pits, egg laying pits created by the female. Then she also, that's what it looks like when she's doing it, frass, that's another name for, in this case it's not just insect excrement, but entomologists call insect excrement frass, and so this is a mixture of the insect excrement and pieces of the tree, looks like excelsior. The beetles themselves, but be careful about the larvae. Bark splitting on healthy trees. Branch breakage. Boy, folks, this is the big one. That's a really big one. Uh, and make sure and teach the folks working with trees here to be on the lookout for that with maples on healthy trees. Can I ask a question? Yes. How many beetles would it have taken to create that many holes in one tree? Now, that's an excellent question. And population dynamics has not been well studied on this insect. So I, I really can't answer it. Oh, no, no, it wasn't just one beetle. It was, well, okay, so each hole represents a, an adult emergence. Now, now, I'll save a little time, although I'm already getting over time, but um, these beetles don't like, they, the, well, I almost said it, they are very good flyers. I almost said they don't like to fly, and I wish I never, because you know, there's no such things as insects, either, either they can or they can't fly. They don't sit there and say, ah, I'm too tired, I don't want to fly. <laughs> you know, I don't know. No, it's, it's only if there is a reason for the survival of the species for them to fly. These are big bombers, so when they do fly, they take up a lot of energy. I said I'm a history buff, so I'm gonna use an analogy. B-17s, remember that? Flying fortresses, well, you don't remember it, but you read about it. Big four-engine bombers, right? And they were sometimes shepherded along by little P-51 Mustangs, single engine. Which one burnt most, the, uh, more gas? The bombers. That's exactly like Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is a P-51 Mustang, Asian longhorn beetle is a bomber. So they will fly if they need to, however, if the, there's still the ability to utilize the tree, they won't fly. So these, I watched beetles emerge the females emerge, I'm gonna to get to what they do here in a second. They feed a little bit and they mate and then they lay eggs. I've watched that right on the same tree. So in answer to your question, I really don't know the number, but I will tell you, it does appear that it can happen very early on because that Stone Lick Township branch breakage started not too many years after the, the, after the wood arrived. So it didn't take very many beetles to translate to those larvae you know, weakening the xylem. I don't, know, I don't know the number, but it can happen very early. Very good question, actually. I, I need to add that in here. 
My point, though, is eradication, though, with emerald ash borer does have what I call the insecticide challenge. You have what kind of feeder? Xylem feeder. This was known before Asian longhorn beetle uh, was found that the xylem is not an effective zone for systemic insecticides. We do not understand why, but it is a fact. This entire area of red is the xylem of this maple. And if I injected this tree with a, with a systemic, it would not affect any insect in that xylem. This larva is at the final instar stage. It's about to pupate. If I treated that maple tree, what am I going to do to that larva? Nothing. It's going to become an adult. It will fly off. Insecticides for ALB, we use the word problematic. That's the right word. Because eradication requires 100% control. Where do insecticides fit into eradication? What would be the role? Now, if you say, well, they aren't 100%, so they don't fit at all, that's not true. But if you say that, well, they are the primary way we can control it and eradicate, that's not true either. You have to put things in the proper context relative to a toolbox. We like to use that word, toolbox. Insecticides are part of the toolbox because the beetles have very powerful mandibles. Remember I told you that the beetles that I watch, you know, the female comes out, she does something with these powerful mandibles. Before she can lay eggs, she goes through what's called maturation feeding. She has to feed a little bit to get the energy to mature her eggs. And there's her feeding. What she's doing is stripping the bark and feeding on the phloem. Ha-ha. If you treat with a systemic, what might happen? You could kill some adults. Big difference. With emerald ash borer, what, are we, what stage are we trying to control as the phloem feeding stage is the larvae. With Asian longhorn beetle, we know we really can't control the larvae, so we target the adults. It is kind of unfortunate that we do have good data showing imidacloprid works, but the efficacy has never been 100%. 50 to 90% has been the best ever achieved. But I'll pose something. 50% is still better than 0%. Would you agree with that? So that, for that reason, imidacloprid has been and continues to be used in conjunction with other eradication tools. It's not the main tool, it's used in conjunction with other tools. Other eradication tools, unfortunately, all we have really that works 100% is to do what? Cut and destroy trees, infested trees. That's all we have. The chainsaw is the most effective thing. Trees come down, they get ground up, they get transported to the marshaling yard, ground in these big tub grinders to a, to a size no greater than an inch in any two directions, two dimensions. Now that becomes mulch. I would have no problem putting that around my house. I'd have no fear. It's now a non-regulated item. There's no way to be spreading Asian longhorn beetle. But there's the impact. You can lose a lot of trees. Look at this home leading up to it. Every tree was infested. Every tree came down. This is what it looked like from the air. 2010, right there's the trees. 2012. It has an impact. It has an impact. On the other hand, if you don't do that, what's the impact? Well, then we're all doing it. Actually, even if we did nothing, our trees would die, and then we'd eventually have to take them down. Which is why sometimes, you know, we look at this beetle and say, well, I'd really love to take a more direct approach, right? I mean, oh, man, this is really, look at that, man. I, you know, it's kind of messy, though. I mean, when you put them in there, it's just, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think of when I go to bed at night. You know, oh, geez. <laughs> so eradication in Ohio, very quickly. I'm a little over time, but uh, so far... By the way, look at these, now this is a bit dated, but uh, it's 2014 last year, but this is pretty good. What I'm showing you is these are positives. Looks like a shotgun blast, but notice that right here is the really concentrated area, right? Now the whole area of quarantine is bounded not by the infestation, but by municipal boundaries. They always do that, or a river. 
So far, almost 1.5 million trees surveyed. Now, I need to give some credit here because we're not just talking about walking past a tree and saying, well, I don't think it's infested. We are talking about dedicated people spending a lot of time. So USDA APHIS and ODA really deserve a lot of credit for the amount of work that they've accomplished in what I consider to be a relatively short period of time. So far, 15,900 trees confirmed infested, 14,684 infested, known infested trees have been removed. Hmm, what is this? 48,617 high risk trees. And what did I say about insecticides? Now, where are we using insecticides? These locations right here and eventually probably out here. Now, why am I going way out here? Because we know we're not going to get 100% control, maybe not even 50%. So why test the insecticide where we have the most beetles? Let's put the insecticide out here as a preventative. Let's put it outside as a bit of a wall. It may be a leaky wall. It may be a wall that allows 50% through, but that's better than zero. Is that correct? Or better than 100% through. I did that in reverse. And that's always been the case with Asian longhorn beetle. Always the case. Insecticides, they learn that they are not successful in the core zone. This was first attempted in Chicago. A good friend of mine with USDA APHIS up there said they got tired of taking down infested treated trees because they tried to do it in the core. And the insecticides just weren't good enough to keep trees from becoming infested. But they might be, and they can be good enough as a protective zone. But let's really focus on this high risk tree thing. Well, let me get high risk trees. What is this doing? What's happening here? And why is it happening? Remember that these are 12 tree genera. Why that's happening is pretty simple. It is a preventative measure because we have a detection challenge. I've made this sound like this is all so cut and dry, haven't I? We know everything. As a matter of fact, we have a real challenge. Now, I want to point out, this tree is losing its canopy not because of Asian longhorn beetle. It had two girdling roots right around the stem, and the owner of this home said when the driveway is right here that when they have a lot of company, they had parked cars under that tree. So this silver maple is having a thinning canopy because of horticultural problems, but it was heavily infested by Asian longhorn beetle. As a matter of fact, this tree was heavily infested. Here's Dr. Curtis Young, my good friend, colleague. I took the picture. We're looking over here. We're looking at this red maple, and we could find no evidence of infestation until a USDA person came over with binoculars and showed us way up here some oviposition pits, way up in the tree. Hard Trained entomologist, I, I would have declared that tree not infested. But what did those pits mean? It was infested. So there's two take-homes that we learned. One is don't jump to conclusions, as we all want to do, because look at the distance between these two trees. There's the tree on the right. It was riddled. In fact, all the images mostly you've seen so far were taken on this tree, including the heavy woodpecker damage. This tree. At that distance, what does that tell you about the rate of spread? Now, I inappropriately concluded, well, maybe red maples are resistant. It turns out research kind of indicates red maples might actually be a little bit preferred. So that was a wrong conclusion on my part. But what did this teach us? It taught us that lightly infested trees, it's rough to identify whether they are infested. In fact, good data has been developed by USDA APHIS to uh, quantify this. They use this to help in their training, but they also use this in their predictive uh, models for what might happen down the road. They know that a very well-trained ground survey team is only going to be 20 to 40 percent effective in discovering lightly infested trees. They know that. This was done by, they would send groups in get the tally up, then they'd take the trees down and they would count. They would actually top to bottom and quantify and they found they're only that good. These are well-trained people, actually trained better than I am. They found that experienced, well-trained climbers are only going to be that good. So what does this mean? 
Let's do a little math here. Let's say we had 100 lightly infested trees. We don't know they're infested. They're lightly infested. We send a survey crew out and we know that they're going to be 20 to 40 percent effective. We know that. The rule that we have, though, is we're only going to take down known infested trees. They discover how many trees? They discover 30. So there's going to be 30 trees, or there's going to be 30 trees taken down, but 70 undetected infested trees. Now let's say we're still a little bit nervous. So let's send out the climbers. They're really good, the climbers. They're up in the tree. Look at this. They're, I mean, I couldn't do this, death defying. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. I'm watching these people up there. It's like, oh my God. And they get way up and they're, but they're only going to be about 70% effective. So they find an additional number of trees. It's going to be 49 trees confirmed infested. So we're going to take those down. But what does that leave? 21 undetected lightly infested trees. And what will eventually happen? They don't become uninfested, folks. They just keep getting more infested, and they are eventually going to release beetles. They re represent a clear and present danger. So let's go back to why high-risk trees. High-risk trees is a very harsh approach, but it is an approach that can be justified based on what I just told you, and that is that you have a known infested tree, and all of the trees that are high-risk species within an uh, eighth of a mile outside of that are taken down, whether they're infested or not. That's throwing up a wall that the beetle has yet to overcome. What's the downside? Now be fair, I, I actually gave this talk in Indianapolis and they said there's no downside. It will protect Indianapolis from this beetle. What's the downside? It's a lot of trees being taken down. If you live there, it's not pleasant. So that, you know, we need to be aware of that. But a lot of people, if you go online, you'll find that more and more people are selecting this option because what's happening is some landowners, okay, they have the survey and some trees are taken down. Then the lightly infested trees reveal the, their presence to be known infested. Then they can, you know, so they have, keep revisiting the properties. And pretty soon you kind of grow tired of it and say, well, maybe we'll get this over with once and for all. Now this is an area that's managed by, uh, this is uh, East Fork Reservoir, obviously U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have an interest. If you lose a lot of trees, that does affect the quality of the water. And so they're having that done there. It's being offered here, but it's not being mandated. It is not being mandated. I'm running out of time. I'm 15 minutes over, but insecticide treatments have been used in every eradication program. Currently, the treatments are only done here. Probably they will be eventually offered out or done out here. Probably, in fact, in fact I'm pretty certain that'll eventually happen. A couple of real quick wrap ups. Who is in charge of this program? Well, and who pays for it? The primary funding comes from USDA APHIS. The secondary funding comes from Ohio Department of Agriculture. So where does the money come from? It is tax dollars. Why I'm telling you this is because you live here in Centerville, and yes, an infestation is over there, but this is also your money. Why this is important is right now, and I will make sure and send the link, right now the USDA APHIS is seeking input on what kind of plans should be used on Asian longhorn beetle should another infestation be discovered. And you can provide input. And I would urge you consider providing input because those are your dollars. I would urge you consider providing input because, you know, in 2010, I didn't know this beetle was in Ohio, did you? None of us knew it. In fact, it was kind of a, we all, let's be honest, it's too bad. Oh, it's too bad. Those poor people up there, there, you know. But we didn't realize then that we all had a stake in this. So who's in charge? APHIS is the federal authority. ODA is the local authority. Now here's something to contemplate. What does that tell you? All that tree removal? In the Ohio Revised Code, it clearly says that ODA could order those trees taken down at the expense of the homeowner, any infested tree, within seven days of being notified. Has that ever happened? It's never happened. 
So all the removals being done at our expense, why I'm making that point is this is very important. This is one point of confusion. There's property, this is a matter area four, state municipal property. Who paid for these trees coming down? Taxpayers. And taxpayers. Some of you may actually recognize this is going into Monroe. Who paid for that big ash being removed? The homeowner. So sometimes you will hear this. So far, and I don't see it changing, I hate that there's no public dollars for that poor homeowner. So far with Asian longhorn beetle, if that were Asian longhorn beetle, that tree would be taken down by our money. That's a big difference, folks. And it's, it's a constant source of confusion. I get calls while well, I've heard there's money to have my tree taken down. It's unfortunate that, well, maybe how to say it, but no, there isn't if it's emerald ash borer. All right, we are almost to the end. Five or six more minutes before I get in my brand new car and fight traffic. <laughs> Head back home. I want you to notice that London is a suburb of Bogstown. I don't know if you people realize that. Some final points, some final very important points, I think. First of all, the good news, I want to stress this, relatively small distinct infestations of Asian longhorn beetle. It means eradication has been successful. All is not lost. I had a guy jumping out a window earlier. Let's revisit that idea. All is not lost. <laughs> but early detection is essential. Be on the lookout for this beetle. Now I want to do this very quickly because this is important. Report suspected ALB infestations and here's the process. You will report it to either ODA or USDA APHIS. You could call Joe Boggs and what am I going to tell you? Well, I'm going to say ultimately I'm not the authority, I'm education. This is like you calling me and saying, Joe, somebody's speeding down the street. I will say, well, I will find them and teach them about that, but I can't arrest them. I can't. <laughs> a regulatory officer will investigate either ODA or USDA APHIS. They will examine the tree for exit holes, pits, beetles, and larvae. They'll examine it. If they don't find it on those trees, they'll look elsewhere, but their goal I want to start. The goal is to find beetles and larvae. There's no confirmation on holes. No confirmation on holes. They've got to find the smoking gun because the beetles will be positively identified by what we call morphometric examination. That's color and size. But more importantly, also a DNA analysis. They, they do this first, then DNA analysis. The larvae are always identified by DNA analysis. And then finally, a public announcement. Those are steps that can be frustrating, I will tell you. If you've made the report and you're pretty sure it's Asian longhorn beetle, waiting for this can seem like an eternity. But you need to wait for that. And a couple of other points I want to make. Beetles and larvae are sacred for ALB confirmation. So if you think you have Asian longhorn beetle, preserve them in alcohol. If you don't want to waste the alcohol, the next, be <laughs> the next best thing is freeze them. Actually, I like the freezing. The freezing part, uh, you put them right in the freezer, you keep them in there, they will remain perfectly good and fresh for quite some time, a little stir fry down the road. <laughs> keep them there until you've made arrangements, though, to have them transferred to the authorities, so keep them in the freezer. and they, It works really good. My point is do this and don't speculate on this. This is a constant challenge. I mean, almost, I'm glad, I, I appreciate, now I'm gonna even preload because almost every ALB talk is somewhere along the line towards the end, I get, well, I saw them last year. First of all, what's wrong with somebody saying that? If they did, and my next question is gonna be what? Did you report it? Oh no, no, I just, I, just, I just know stuff. That is not what we need, folks, because if you claim you're seeing these beetles everywhere, what's the implications for eradication? It, it means eradication won't work, it's all over the place. I'm quite certain they're not all over the place, but they may be someplace we haven't detected them. So don't speculate. 
Stay up to date and don't spread rumors. I can't stress that enough. We don't need any more of this. Now, there is no Asian longhorn beetle in New Mexico. There's none in Taos. But look at what this writer in the Taos News wrote. You'll probably encounter in New northern New Mexico, these are the cricket and the Asian longhorn beetle. And both are very common in Taos County. I don't know what they're producing or growing out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is not good. And, and folks, this was cited in another article later on written by an individual who then was claiming Asian longhorn beetle was everywhere. Do you see the cascade? All right. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. My favorite quote, just the facts. Stay up to date, come to non-biased research-based sources, and one of the best, if you write this down, AsianLonghornBeetle.com, one Asian Longhorn Beetle, um, you will then, there's Phil Baldoff, he's the project uh, uh, manager over in Claremont County, and this is the most important thing. You can go to that website and you can make the report right there. You don't even have to call. You can hit yes, and there it is. You can make the, there's also phone numbers that you can call. And that is the end, and I went way over, I apologize, but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to make you aware of this insect. Any, uh, any quick questions? So we're not here until eight o'clock? <laughs> well, she's asking, is there no alternative to chemicals? Well, certainly, yeah, taking the tree down, destroying it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, it's kind of a reverse thing. With emerald ash borer, no, the, the, in terms of if you wanted to save your ash tree, that's the only option you have. Um, in terms of eliminating the insect, obviously taking it down. It's sort of a reverse idea with Asian longhorn beetle. The insecticides aren't good enough that I could tell you that it's going to keep your tree safe. So the only way to be sure that the beetle's eradicated is the tree's taken down. And why that's so important, why that question is so important, is that goes all the way back to the difference between these beetles. One, we're not trying to eradicate because we can't. The other is eradication. And I can't stress enough, if we, are, if we fail on this, a little side note, I'm not trying to get, we've never seen anything like this. You might say, well, Joe, we live through uh, emerald ash borer, it's pretty bad, ash trees, maybe a little bit of white fringe tree, but well, we live through, maybe not all of us, chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease. Except what's consistent with what I've just said? One species, one, gen, one genus, Dutch elm disease elms. Chestnut blight, only American chestnut. What's the problem with Asian longhorn beetle? And I hate to tell you this, that's 12 that we know of right now. It could change. Probably won't be oak, but the point of it is that's devastating, yes. A a excellent question. Actually, if you buy from a nursery, they, they are certified to be free of detectable pests, and this is a, that's important because that's another thing that Ohio Department of Agriculture does. Uh, Kentucky, same thing. They have nursery inspectors. So having managed a tree farm for some years, uh, nursery inspectors are very, very helpful. They're your extra set of eyes, so the, they come in periodically and they inspect for that reason. Well, that's a good question. Uh, emerald ash borer goes down to about finger size in terms of uh, stem size. Asian longhorn beetle, there's a bit of a discussion about that. Uh, just because of the size of larvae, probably inch diameter is about as small as we could go. And uh, in other words, when you get that small, the larvae are so big, you know, <laughs> it'd probably break. And then it's waving its tarsi. What happened? So, you know, just some, uh, so. Uh, but anything above that, and that includes branches. Uh, something I didn't put in here, uh, and I always mean to include it, emerald ash borer, something else we learned and we taught it was they tended to start at the top and work their way down with each generation or outside in. Asian longhorn beetle can be anywhere on that tree. They can be at the top laying eggs and at eye level laying eggs at the same time. That's actually a good thing. You know, it makes it a little more likely for discovering them. But so far, the research hasn't shown with Asian longhorn beetle a preference for diameter. 
Uh, it hasn't shown that I'm aware of any preference relative to uh, tree health. Our native boars only go after stressed, dead or, or stressed dying or dead trees. Emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle because the U.S. hosts have never encountered these beetles, so they never developed defenses, will go after perfectly healthy trees. I, yes? Three questions. You said... No, you only get one. He only got one. <laughs> Oh, good. Where you had all the trees have been cut down. Yeah. That's yeah. not a risk as an incubation place for the long run. All right, so if, if the beetle, if the larvae are in the tree when the tree is taken down, they can complete their development. Okay, okay but once that tree hits the ground, that female will not lay, uh, another female will not lay an egg on that tree. Very, very good point. Um, and females will not lay eggs on dead trees. Okay, now there is a bit of a challenge. If a tree's standing, you saw how riddled that one tree was. It does appear that, man, they will keep laying eggs until that tree, what they saw in Chicago, what they've seen in Worcester, Massachusetts, is they really drive that tree to death. And, and that's important to know because it means that they concentrate there before they say, I'm going to have to go somewhere else. But also what's important is that tree remains high risk through a very long period. Think about it. With emerald ash borer, they could kill the tree so fast, once the tree's dead, it's no longer useful. So, you know, you see a standing dead in ash and it's no longer useful. Even after it gets to a certain place, it's not going to be useful. With Asian longhorn beetle, man, they really stay with those trees and keep laying eggs on those trees. And that's important to remember that. Yes? Is there, in China, is there, a, or is there a natural predator to the longhorn beetle? It's, there, no doubt there probably are, um, but that's a very good question because often, emerald ash borer in China, is, is, there, were, there were three scientific papers before it was discovered in the U.S., and two of them were suspect. Because in China, emerald ash borer was just in the background. There was no reason to do a lot of research. Asian longhorn beetle is actually a, a, a big pest in China. They have these, these huge poplar plantations. Poplar is a very clear wood. It's used obviously for packing material. That's the big thing. Also, believe it or not, that clear wood, they make very good chopsticks. Make very, so that's the preferred wood for making uh, eating implements. So it's a high demand wood and they're using primarily non-native poplars that then it's the reverse over there. So there's been work done, and the thinking is that with a new host of poplar, it's so good for the beetle that they're outstripping their native. You know, why are they past? Because there's so many numbers, and that tends to be how it works. You know, native, um, I call them three Ps. So let's use fall webworm as an example. Remember I, I said it's in, kept in check. That's predators, parasitoids, which are different than parasites. Parasites like a tick that unless it's spreading a disease it doesn't kill you, but that tick doesn't have in mind killing you. A parasitoid is like having a lion inside of you. It feeds from the inside out. We've all seen this with, with tomato hornworms with the sprouting cocoons. So predators, parasitoids, and pathogens are three Ps. And so our native insects like fall webworm are kept in check by that because they've co-evolved. They grew up together. The three Ps, you know, but if the three Ps were so good as to kill every one of them, what would we do? What would we be talking about? Extinction. Extinction, exactly. So natural three Ps can suppress populations, but it won't drive them to zero. And usually the suppression is very, very little. Now, there, is, there are being releases of um, parasitoid wasps, both for the eggs and larvae of emerald ash borer. Now, everything I said, it makes it sound like, well, there's no hope. Well, eventually, emerald ash borer populations are going to be driven down very low when there are no ash trees, right? So once you get down there, then maybe a parasitoid could help keep them down there. Maybe. But for Asian longhorn beetle, you know, it's a tree killer, and we really can't wait around until, you see what I'm saying? You can't have like a 30% infestation. Yes? The decimation of the tree is out at John... State Park. John, yeah, oh yeah, they, yeah. It's a, it's a 
to huge amount of trees. Um, I love that park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is very, very close to the. Um, this is Emerald Ash Borer. To the camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would it be that somebody carried in logs for their campfire? Well, it, it very well could be, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, and it's really funny, John Bryant and then Clifton Gorge, Clifton Mill, where do you think that pan pancake shot was taken? <laughs> I think we should just go from here to there. What do you think? I'm... John Bryant, though, probably, I mean, that could be a possibility. It could be always, with, but it could also have been that they moved, because by the time those, uh, what she's referring to is really, I've taken pictures, of a, I mean, that, a lot of ash. In that, in that, uh, yeah, it is. But it could have been firewood, but it could have come from the surrounding area because by the time those ash really started showing infestation symptoms, we were seeing in Yellow Springs and the surrounding area uh, very clear evidence. So that wasn't like a point source out; it was more or less coming in. Good questions, though. Yes. How long have you lived, and do you survive our winters? Oh, good for you. Yeah, that's a very good question. In both cases. Both cases, emerald ash borer, the, is only one generation per year, and the adults do not overwinter. Asian longhorn beetle, one generation per year, and the adults do not overwinter. We know with Asian longhorn beetle that the adults will die at the first freeze or frost. Now, well, it's almost like a place where I'm going to turn off my, because this is pure speculation, what I'm about to tell you, but and there's uh, no work that we've been able to do because part of the frustration with Asian longhorn beetle is where is the best place to do the research? It's not in Bethel because, you know, we're eliminating the beetles as best we can. It's in China, which is very expensive. You know, you send a research now. Chinese have perfectly great scientists themselves, but it'd be great with more collaborative, you know, but that's expensive. You send a team over there from here, it's expensive. <clears throat> so last summer, we have, well, let me back up. We have probably one of the best serambicid ex experts in, in the United States, one of the best. Her name's Annie Ray, Ann Ray with uh, Xavier University. Dr. Ann Ray did her PhD on serambicids out at University of Illinois. So she came here to teach at Xavier, but guess what? She's also now working with USDA APHIS in doing research in Bethel, which is fantastic. I mean, we're very lucky. That was not planned, it just, oh my gosh. Last summer, though, she had very few beetles. In fact, last summer, both in Worcester, Massachusetts and in Bethel, there were very few beetles. So few that some of the trapping studies, not enough to, to know. What happened? Well, that's the speculation, because let's go back a, a, a little different way. These, these are hot, I call hot-loving beetles. Really interesting. I would go over, the, the, another question is, is that kind of goes, when would you be most likely to find a lot of beetles would be July. And a hot day in July, man, those beetles love it hot. I would go over there in the mornings, and it was going to get to be 85, but the morning it was just, the beetles would just be hanging out. I mean, not moving until it got really warm, and then they'd start moving. Now, I think part of that is these are ectothermic, they're cold-blooded. And, you know, we do have this challenge with something being really big, it takes a lot, it takes longer to cool down, but what's the reverse of that? Longer to warm up. And so their metabolism is tied to, to heat, but also I'm speculating, pure, I could put that bovine thing up there, maybe I should. <laughs> But uh, it, it's, it's being speculated that maybe that could be a good thing, you know, with having a tough. Now, last, not this past winter, winter before last, there's all this noise about emerald ash borer with temperatures dropping. No, emerald ash borer, remember, is native all the way up into the Koreas. North Korea gets pretty dang cold. As a matter of fact, the research showed that the kind of temperatures to suppress emerald ash borer would be something we would probably never experience here. And we're talking multiple days at minus 20 degrees. So we just probably aren't likely. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Other questions? This is good. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, you had three. You only did one. What if, what if any work is being done to, uh, you, you mentioned trees with natural immunities type thing, to maybe create some species that, you know, 
that we can plant to replace what we're losing now? It's a very good question. I would not today do any anticipatory planting relative to Asian longhorn beetle. Does everybody hear what I just said? If you're on the tree committee here and you're planting, I wouldn't say, well, we shouldn't plant maples. What I would do is say, we need to have a list of five, six, seven, eight, ten different species, maybe more. Diversity, we learned with, with, with emerald ash borer is a good thing. Now, and, 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 and the reason is I'm, every year I'm feeling more and more confident that eradication will be successful in, in Claremont County, every year. Every year there's not another infestation found, it means that that's even more likely, okay? So I have no reason, you know, to, to suspect that you couldn't plant maples and, you know. Now, uh, ash, that's a different story because you have one genus, right? Fraxinus. And it turns out there is a lot of work being done. Uh, we know that with emerald ash borer, the Asian species, as you would expect, aren't killed by emerald ash borer because that's native on native, okay? Um, we know blue ash, now I need to say this because I don't want this to be misread, blue ash has a little less susceptibility, at all. we always knew that. But we have clear records, I've even taken photographs of blue ash killed by emerald ash borer here in Ohio. Last year though, outside of Detroit, there was a group of blue ash trees that simply should not be alive. They're alive, why are they? Well, perhaps they have the genetic ability and we call this provenance, meaning that within a range of a species of tree, you have genetic variability, right? So you have ash, blue ashes that are native, you know, all the way up into Michigan, all the way down through our state and they don't get together to date very easily, right? They don't get on buses. So you end up getting a little genetic variability and that's called provenance. And it's always related to the geographical area. So maybe there's a little bit of a genetic variability there that's helping them to survive emerald ash borer. It's being investigated and that's as far as I wanna take it. Don't go, don't leave here thinking blue ash is resistant or that we even have a hope yet. However, you can plant American elms. Why? Because it was found that you can plant true American elms. You can plant American elms that are resistant to the Dutch elm disease fungus that are that way because they're crossed with other world elms, Asian or European, mostly Asian species. But you also, they found American elm trees by provenantial differences that are true, they're not crossed with anything. They are true American elms. Princeton. For example, is an American elm that you can plant that's resistant to Dutch elm disease. Hasn't been found with chestnuts yet, but if we look at that, believe me, yes, that's guiding researchers. Yes? Well, that brings up the thought, going back to China, if there are any ash trees there that are resistant to the emerald ash borer. Oh, there is, that's why I said yes. Then yeah, Manchurian ash, for example, yeah. That work's being done as, as we speak, yeah. One thing that they're looking at though, they're even going further, it's kind of fun, the US Forest Service up in Delaware has a really nice research project looking at the chemical signatures of what makes those trees resistant. And so this is where I go back with, ash, with white and green ash, you know, native white and green ash, so the chemical signatures of those trees are actually very di a little different than, than blue ash. And of course Manchurian is way over here. So what in the chemical makeup of that tree might be contributing and then identifying those genes. So I suspect very shortly that there will actually be you know, some genetic modifications instead of waiting around, yes. I think that in reverse, we got 12 genera as you mentioned that the longhorn yeah. likes or yeah. prefers, if yeah. you know, what yeah. is the common thing. Well, and that's a that it seems to like? That's a very good question. And I, I hate to say this because you've hit in an area that is actually an entire, yeah, well, it's a huge host preferential science because the name for an insect that describes that way is, is called polyphagus, polyphagus or polyphagus. Phage means to eat, poly, many. 
Whenever you have a polyphagous insect, it's meaning not so much that they're finding something in the tree they like, in as much as it means that they have a lot of trees that have no defenses against them. It's a reverse thing. And you always have to think of that with a boar. You always have to think, there's always a war going on. So polyphagous insects are more scary for that reason because they've been able to overcome a lot of defenses. I, the, I mean, the good example, and I meant to point this out, Katsura trees, for crying out loud, Katsura. Now, Katsura trees, where are they native to? Sounds like Asia. Japan. Now, emerald ash borer, or Asian longhorn beetle is not native to Japan. So Katsura trees, though, we find nothing. I found a little fall web worm on them over the years. Beyond that, nothing. What's that tell you about the chemical defenses of Katsura? If you find nothing, it's pretty hot, yeah. It's a tree that Asian longhorn beetle will just riddle. So you see where I'm heading. I mean, that's... I don't think we're going to breed our way out of Asian longhorn beetles, is what I'm trying to say. I think we can breed our way out of maybe emerald ash borer. I think down the road we may have ash trees that we can bring back that look great the way that we want them to. We, we've certainly bred our way out of uh, Dutch elm disease, have we not? I mean, these native elms are getting big. There's hope with chestnuts. I still hold out hope. Uh, that was a big tree in my native West Virginia. But we're not going to do that with Asian longhorn beetle, I'm sorry to say. Yes? Isn't that a positive side of genetic modification or GMO? You know, we're, everybody growing up ours is about genetically modified plants, not animals, but plants. Mm -hmm. This is the positive side of that. Well, it would, certainly, it would certainly speed up the introduction. You're right. That's what I was talking about with if we knew in the genetic, the genome, of ash, what it is that makes the tree either resistant or susceptible. What are those genes? And we find genes that are responsible for susceptibility and, disease and resistance over here. If we take those genes over here and put them into a green ash, then you're exactly right. Gene splicing and people know how to do that. And that may happen, I don't know. But it to me is a possible positive, yeah. On the other hand, as you very well know, it doesn't, I'm not talking about risk of, you know, you know, Frankenstein tree, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden, well, it's moving. But it may turn out that those genes are coupled to something else. There may be something, it may make the tree more susceptible to verticillium wilt. See, that's always a funny thing when you start messing around, you know, even, and as a matter of fact, the old gene splicing, as Greg Armendel did, everybody follow what I'm saying? He didn't, he just used natural crossing which is an old gene splicing. You don't want to recognize that, but it is. Still gene modification. It, exactly. You're still modifying the genetic material. We've done that. We've had trees that have been resistant to problems, and we said, boy, they have nice flowers. This has nice flowers, not just trees, other plants, and we've crossed them. And guess what? The new ones are, they may look great, but they've lost, we've lost what protected them against things. There's a honey locust that is named for a town very close to here. What is the name of that town? What's the name of the honey locust? Moraine Honey Locust. Oh my gosh. Named after Moraine, Ohio, right? And it still remains a beautiful honey locust and some of the biggest thornless honey locusts you'll find in Cincinnati are no doubt Moraines. They were resistant to a lot of things we didn't even know they were resistant to. Well, honey locust became so popular and then all of a sudden not by gene splicing, but by selective breeding. We had all these wonderful other honey locusts. Oh, I'm sorry, geez, she's, she's quiet. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and so the point being is that honey locusts then were planted all over the place. What happened? When I started with the extension, they were falling out of favor because these new types were just susceptible to everything and actually a lot of them died. I had a whole talk on honey locust pests and diseases that now I can no longer do because the ones that were selectively made susceptible, does everybody follow that? Are dead. What's left? Good old Moraines. You go to Middletown and they're all over. I just, I'm sorry, a little side. Sorry, Jan, I just got carried away there. I, I wish you did. I, I didn't mean for you to sound like I, you scared me. I mean. <laughs> I am no, no, thanks a lot, folks. I went way over. Thanks for putting up with me.